Hello, welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Ball. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by CommercialAgentSuccess.com. It is the ultimate and experienced real estate broker training. Learn more at CommercialAgentSuccess.com. Well, today, we're going to talk about retail. My guest is Tom LaSalvia. He's Senior Economist with Moody's Analytics. Tom, thank you for joining us, sir. Michael, always a pleasure. Happy to be here today. Well, thank you. And we're going to talk about cap rates. We're going to talk about retail rents, what they've been doing. What are cap rate trends? What have they been doing? What do we expect on rental rates and cap rates? We're going to talk about retail sales, how the sales been doing. You know, what are some of the more popular property types with tenants and and what about tenant demand? We'll get into that sort of thing. So, Tom, if you will, kind of start us out with retail sales. You know, here we are. It's uh, practically March 1st here. So we went through the holiday season, the beginning of the year. What did you see? Yeah, it's a great question. And it was a bit of a roller coaster ride, to be honest with you. The early holiday shopping season, October into early November, was actually quite, quite good. And then we got some surprising December numbers. Maybe it had to do a little bit with Omicron or at the very end there. Uh, but that's probably not the case because the January numbers were fantastic and really fantastic across the board. Uh, we saw the uh, quite an increase in sales of, of durables, non-durables, uh, in-person activity, uh, restaurants, different experiential type of things. So in a way, you know, Omicron, while it affected a little bit of travel, uh, it affected some hotel numbers on that side of things from the retail perspective, at least from spending, um, the numbers are trending up right now. And Tom, I think some people would think that uh, retail sales you know, would have suffered a little bit with people being locked down and that sort of thing, or in some cases, some cities. Um, how do sales in retail compare now to what they were in 2019 to, to kind of give us some perspective? Quite a bit higher. Uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but we're looking at double digits in terms of percentage growth over wow. those numbers. So, I mean, it's, it's substantial. And, you know, you really got to think about it this way. Most the, the majority of people kept their jobs getting raises or changing jobs and getting raises through that, or they had stimulus money and there was a lot of excess savings because for a little while in 2020, they couldn't do a lot. And so, you know, people have the money to spend. Um, stock markets for a while did well, although the last month has been pretty, pretty rough. Um, but yeah, there's, there was a lot of money, a lot of wealth out there, and, you know, American consumers love to spend. And before we get into some of the kind of the real estate oriented questions for you, Tom, what about uh, expected sales moving forward? We're expecting them to remain stout, uh, you know, as long as some of the geopolitical issues out there, the, the conflict in Ukraine does not work its way deeper into the U.S. economy. We're still expecting uh, GDP to be near 4% this year, um, employment to get to full employment uh, by the end of this year, which means more people with uh, more money to spend. We, we still expect uh, wage increases as well. So yeah, I think retail sales should hold up really well with, of course, that caveat as, um, you know, what's happening uh, overseas right now. And, you know, some of the inflation issues, which are tied to that, obviously with oil could bring some other issues in the economy. But yeah, even with all that said, we still expect GDP to be stout and the employment situation to be stout, which should bleed its way into uh, decent retail spending. Um, actually, one more caveat to give you that dawned on me um, that I think is important in this context is uh, consumer sentiment. So this is interesting, right? Because we have really good expectations for sales. We have good expectations for the economy overall. Uh, but the uh, University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment um, index is showing numbers, uh, some of their lowest numbers that they've had in, in quite a while. Uh, but when we dig into that research, it's much more related to inflation than expectations of employment or expectations of their spending habits. So there is this relation, you know, consumers aren't happy because of inflation, but they're still spending. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Too, we look at some of the um, price increases we've seen for, you know, groceries and and gasoline and everything. It doesn't uh, seem to slow down. Well, Tom, what about some of the categories? Uh, you know, this is a commercial America's commercial real estate show. A lot of our listeners are in the industry. Uh, what are some of the retailer categories that are maybe doing well or, or maybe having some struggle? Yeah, on the doing well side, uh, limited service restaurant space, excellent, right? I think, you know, that drive throughs, you know, we saw a pickup big, big time um, in 2020, 2021 again, and expected to continue to do uh, quite well. Uh, store openings, we've done a lot of research into that. And once again, limited service. Um, food establishments continue to open at record numbers uh, on the, you know, continuing on the doing well side are grocery anchored spaces and, you know, not so well. It's, it's an old story at this point, but some of the older class BC properties, obviously some of those in particular malls, uh, they need to be repurposed. And, you know, that's something that uh, we are actually seeing a bit of pickup on is, is that repurposing. Yeah. And what about the actual retailers themselves as far as uh, you mentioned restaurants are doing well, and that's good to hear. What about some of the other categories? Yeah, it may be a surprise to some, but we are seeing a pickup in activity from apparel retailers, uh, beauty. Um, we're seeing a lot of openings of like Ulta Beauty and stores um, that, that fit that description. And, you know, then we're seeing a big pickup in what were traditionally uh, e-commerce stores moving into brick and mortar, right? This whole omni-channel evolution of retail is actually happening. You know, Warby Parker being one of the, um, the, key, um, the key businesses there that's really expanding, but there's, there's quite a few others. Uh, there's also, you know, movements of, of companies like Nike that are, uh, gaining uh, square footage for their uh, attempt at uh, customization or allowing their customers to customize products, right? And I think there's something really interesting about that um, as we move forward, that there really is this omni-channel approach to retail, right? Consumers have shown that they not only want to shop in-store, and in e-commerce, they want that combination. But I think retailers themselves, it's been an interesting evolution to them, um, for them, where they're finding that having that physical presence helps, you know, with some of that customization stuff, but also it helps facilitate like pickups and returns too, right? And that's important given some of the uh, logistic issues, supply chain issues uh, that we've had. So it's these, these stores, the physical stores are giving the retailer uh, um, a place to make the consumer kind of a, a full part of the retail process. And I think that's a really interesting evolution recently that retailers have picked up on and they want that brick and mortar presence. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, Tom, what about um, retail rents? Because you know, we've all seen some vacancies you know, uh, in areas where we live or some big boxes with, uh, with either empty, dark, or, or very few cars in the parking lot. What, how are you seeing that impact rental rates for retail properties around the country overall? Stable, flat. Um, you know, there was some decline through 2020, not as much as what we would have expected through the early part of 2021 as well. And then in the second half of the year, we actually started to see it reverse and we saw a little bit of growth, um, very, very modest growth. We're talking maybe, you know, 0.2% over a quarter, something like that. So something not even amounting to 1% for the year, right, in an annualized way. But it's turned the corner, right? That's a really big positive, I think, for a sector that a lot of folks expected, you know, rents to be trending downward for quite a while. Um, I think originally we were expecting a much larger decline in rents and a recovery not to a full recovery in the rent level not to happen until say 2024 or even 2025 for retail. And yeah. it's already there, right? I mean, I think that's pretty fascinating for the sector and shows its, its resilience and it shows how much that both on the consumer side 
and on the tenant side, they believe in uh, brick and mortar. Yeah, we're talking with Tom Salvia with uh, Moody's Analytics about retail, and and as as I mentioned a moment ago, we all have seen some big boxes empty. What about occupancy levels uh, for retail? What are you seeing there as a trend? Uh, hanging out around ninety um, percent. Right, and that's going to vary depending on the property. It's going to vary depending on the market. We have some markets that are well below that ten percent. We have others that are considerably higher. Uh, the trends there is the markets that um, tend to be gaining population. So those those smile states or those warm weather areas that have gained a bit of population over time uh, tend to be trending in um, a downward vacancy or upward occupancy way. Whereas some of uh, the Midwest where you've seen some out migration, especially in some of those older neighborhoods, it's been a little bit tougher on those properties. And, you know, and, and once again, I hate to pick on malls, but of course, some of those older class B and C malls, um, you know, we got to a point where they became obsolete and, you know, they're now completely, um, completely vacant, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And Tom, what about the popularity for retail tenants when they're looking for a new space? What type of properties and developments uh, do they really want to be in? That's a fantastic question. And actually, we are really starting to see some shifts here. Um, I don't think it's pandemic related. I think the writing was on the wall a little bit even prior to the pandemic. But when we when we look at where tenants are occupying and when we look at where uh, developers, how they're developing, we're seeing just an awful lot of mixed use lifestyle type of development, right? Where you have you know, at a minimum, you have some multifamily or office within walking distance, but there's a lot of these whole mixed use lifestyle type planned almost communities that have a very much a retail element in addition to their multifamily office, you know, there's the experiential side of the retail, there's the uh, more more good side of the retail that are all part of this and actually, you know, if you look at our our planned proposed under construction properties, just an awful, awful lot of them, um, record numbers are actually, you know, being categorized as that lifestyle or that mixed use. Yeah. What about adaptive reuse for retail, maybe properties that are being changed and used for retail or were retail and being used for something else? You seen any kind of new trends there? Yeah, you know, for sure. And this is a really good sign in my opinion, because we are starting to see, in particular, some of these older mall spaces, but uh, whether they be indoor mall or older strip malls, that there is reuse. There is um, capital market activity. There is development activity. Uh, there's uh, current owners are finding ways to actually go in there and, you know, have a greater diversity of tenants. Some of those are strictly sticking towards retail side of things, and it's an experiential retail and those, that good retail. Others that are repurposing are going into it with a mindset of let's do what the new developers are doing and let's put in some multifamily. Let's knock down this part of the old mall and put in housing or put, on, put in some medical office, right? And so what I love about this and what excites me about this is now there's a model, right? And there's a model that is at least somewhat proven, maybe not proven over a very long term, but there's owners and developers that are getting financing green lit for these projects and they're showing gains. They're, they're completing these projects and they're showing foot traffic increasing in these places and it seems to be working. So what makes me really excited is that means that model Right. There's there's proof in the pudding in a sense. Right. So somebody, a creative developer, a creative owner can go to a bank, go to an investor and say, hey, listen, they did this over here. This is why I think it works with my property. And I think we are going to see, you know, not these eyesores right along highways or wherever they, they were, but we are going to see some pretty quality adaptive reuse. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly some great uh, locations, right, for some of these uh, retail properties. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Tom, what about um, cap rates on investment sales for retail? What are you seeing trend-wise there? 
Yeah, so we've seen, you know, from, from 2019 levels, we've seen somewhere maybe between a 60 and 90 basis point increase. So there, there had been priced in a little bit of additional stress in there. Uh, currently, we're in a range of, of six to maybe eight and a half percent for a lot of the deals we see happening, a lot of the projects that we see happening out there. Um, the median skews that towards the six percent, which shows us that there's a little bit more of, of class A properties that have been trading, at least in our transaction database. Uh, but, you know, it's not as though they are the, the cap rates are skyrocketing, uh, showing a lot of stress. And I think that goes along with what we've seen in the space market activity, right? That there's really no reason to believe in this, this word apocalypse anymore when it comes to retail, whether it's there's the ability to reuse, uh, repurpose, or there's going to be a return. Um, and you're going to be able to get tenants that are modern tenants into that space. And so there's, there's no reason for these properties to trade at much lower prices or much higher cap rates um, than, than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, and here we are. It's almost March 1, and um, we got a lot going on in the world. So it's a little hard to predict. It's always a little hard, hard to predict anyway, maybe even harder now. But what would you predict? Uh, seeing the trends and, and what you're seeing so far in retail and retail real estate, what would you predict for occupancy rates and rental rates for retail moving forward? I don't think they change very much over the next couple of years, to be honest. Uh, you know, like I said, there's there's positive momentum, but it's not as though we're you know extremely bullish on this like we might be for multifamily or even industrial. Um, you know, so I would expect the national level vacancy rate to hover around 10%, maybe drop just below that over the next few years. Uh, but we are going to see a bit more property, a bit more um, inventory growth in the next year or so. Um, in 2021, we actually saw record low inventory growth. So that helped prop up some of the performance metrics and keep that stability. Uh, we're going to see a little bit more this year and a little bit more maybe the year after that. And so that will put a little pressure on the vacancy rates, but we're not going to see much in terms of rising or falling. I expect right around 10%. In terms of rent growth, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we had a long term or let's say a short to midterm um, rent growth path of about 2% annualized. So, you know, not great, but also, you know, not terrible. Right. So I think there's enough rent growth potential. Uh, there's enough stability to keep uh, investors very much engaged uh, in this in this sector, um, especially if they can get a little bit of a deal and, you know, have a little bit of creativity or have some connections with certain tenants that they believe are modern tenants that will draw foot traffic. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And on cap rates, you talked about uh, the, the prices uh, in 2019 have have come down a little bit. The cap rates have increased a, a little bit. Uh, what do you expect moving forward for cap rates? Yeah, so a lot going on, as you just mentioned, a lot going on right now in terms of inflation, in terms of some of the other issues in the world. Um, uh, the Fed is likely to come and be somewhat aggressive with uh, interest rates. Uh, we'll see, depending on some of the inflationary pressures and some of the new data that comes in over the next month or so, um, that will put a little bit of upward pressure on cap rates. Uh, but we, we do expect that, generally speaking, commercial real estate is going to be a desirable asset in relation to the other assets out there. Right. So, you know, you have opportunity costs, you have other things that you can invest in with your money. Um, but with some of the uncertainties in the world and what's going on and some of the positive trends in U.S. commercial real estate, we think it's going to be a strong asset. So if anything, you know, I see spreads tightening a little bit. At the same time, cap rates do go go up a little bit. Right. So, you know, interest rates are definitely going to be going up. So there's going to be a little pressure once again on cap rates to go up, but I do see spreads actually tightening a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So again, we said it's almost March one here and uh, we have divisions of our company to sell different property types. And we're still seeing a lot of momentum from the really huge demand that we had last year. And I think part of the demand from last year was from the scare on the 1031 and, and uh, 
capital gains increases, but we're still seeing a lot of buyer demand. And I'd say we're getting, I'd say 10 to 15% of the offers we're getting on properties right now are adjusting somewhat for uh, higher interest rates. So that means, you know, 85, 90% of the offers are like just as great as they were last year. <laughs> so kind of an interesting window we're in. Very much, yes. Uh, because, you know, hey, what's the, the Fed's been talking about maybe three or four rate increases this year? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there was five. I wouldn't be surprised if in March it's 50 basis points and not 25. Um, but that's still a little bit up in the air. Maybe I'd put it 50-50 at that point as to what yeah. it will be. And But you're right, another three or four after that. And, you know, those, those coupons in the... the threes or low fours are likely, you know, a thing of the past. Um, you know, something other interesting we've been following is uh, some of the coverage and leverage required uh, in the retail side, right? So I've been, you know, overall positive, I think, in our discussion today. Um, but just in relation to multifamily, right? I mean, a lot of the properties, um, a lot of the deals have needed coverage of near 3x from what we've seen in our data set, whereas multifamily only a shade over two in terms of debt service coverage ratio, uh, needing leverage around 55% where they're willing to go, you know, quite a bit higher for multi certain multifamily uh, properties. You know, of course, that's on average and there's weak assets and strong assets in retail, but, you know, it's, it's good to have that relationship and see that relationship between multifamily. Um, and retail. So, you know, yes, I think overall capital markets um, and capital market participants uh, feel pretty good about retail, uh, but but not as good about uh, uh, retail as they do about multifamily and industrial. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, interesting to see if, you know, if cap rates, um, you know, cap rates don't run right along with interest rates, right? Interest rates might rise, you know, 100 basis points and the cap rates aren't going to do that. But if it goes up 100 basis points, uh, the financing, it's going to impact cap rates, isn't it? It will, you know, yeah. yeah. So, so there will be upward movement if we see that type of pace and that type of magnitude of those increases. Undoubtedly, they have to. But, but you're right. You, your statement you made before that was the correlation between interest rates and cap rates are, is very, very far from perfect. If anything, it's surprisingly um, weak, that correlation, when you actually, you know, say graph out the two charts, um, the cap rate with the, with the um, say, 10-year treasury or whatever interest rate you want to use. But yeah, you, you're absolutely right that if they do go up and they do go up in a magnitude like that, it is going to put some pressure. And Tom, if you could leave our audience with, with the discussion about the percentage of online sales compared to uh, brick and mortar, kind of the trends you're seeing there. Yeah, this is fascinating to me, right? I mean, in mid-2020, well, actually it was April and, and May of 2020, you know, share of e-commerce in terms of total retail sales just blossomed and I had to, right? Everybody had to be at home. We had no choices to go to the stores. And so everyone was doing what they could to get whatever they needed. Um, and then it is slowly declined, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that at this point, the share of e-commerce, of total retail sales, dropped below 13%. It's sitting right now at about 12.9%. Now, this this is actually below the trend growth path pre-pandemic, right? So imagine a graph and imagine you had the trending since say year 2000 and it kind of looked exponentially increasing the way it was working with, with e-commerce. And we got to right before the pandemic, I think 11.4% or so. But if you, if you kind of moved that out to 2022, where we are right now, it probably, it was, it was trending about like it would have gotten to 13 to 14%. We're at 12.9% right now. So really fascinating. I think part of it is that a lot of folks got so tired of being in all the time that they went out and spent, right? Yeah. So e-commerce couldn't be part of it if they really, really wanted to go out and spend. And maybe it's that pent up thing. And, and I'm guessing, I'm forecasting that it will start to rise again 
right? I think the declines, you know, beyond 12.9%, I don't think we go much lower than that. I think we kind of get back to that growth path that we were on prior to the pandemic. But it's not as though as the pandemic really shocked us to a new growth path. And that's what I find fascinating is that human beings like to spend their money, yes, but we like to spend it in person quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We, we want to get out. I think uh, everybody's tired of being alone or being home. I mean, especially if you had to work, if you have to work at home, and that's the way I say it. If, if you made me work at home, I wouldn't like it. If I had to work at home, I'm really wanting to get out of the house. I'm at home when I'm at home. I'm home when I'm at work. Let's get out and do some shopping. Absolutely. Tom, what would you leave our audience to think about for retail uh, moving forward? Anything, anything jump out? Like, is there anything that retailers uh, by, by chance are concerned about right now or maybe excited about? On the concern side, you know, there are some worries uh, that consumer confidence is going to lead its way into retail spending. I think if the Fed does its job really well and properly balances rate increases, brings the inflation rate down with the assistance, oh, you know, we didn't even mention the, you know, on the inflation rate side, it's not all about increasing interest rates. We've seen a lot of improvement with um, the supply chain stress, right? And so that's going to alleviate some of that pressure. Now, oil prices are going up, so there's still an issue there. But if the Fed does their job, and I do believe in them very much that they're going to find this proper balance between raising rates and keeping the labor market strong, it's going to bring that confidence level back, right? But I think there's a little bit of concern there for retailers that they might um, not get as much spending in the coming um let's say months. On the positive side of things is, well, much of this conversation, right? I think we're beyond the shocks for the most part. I think we're moving towards a new equilibrium. I think there's new models out there, whether it's from that repurposing perspective uh, or it's from the omni-channel, Right. I just I'm very, very bullish in the sense that we are moving to this new era of retail and it still means very good things overall for brick and mortar. Yeah. Some of my audience may be curious, uh, Tom, um, how you look at this and, and maybe how the retailers look at it when they're reporting their e-commerce sales and their brick and mortar sales. Where do they put sales that are ordered online and they come to the store and pick it up? Yeah, that's a, actually a very, very good question. And that is, in, um, from my understanding, that is an e-commerce sale. Now, what's interesting about that is that when they come to the store, the retailers are finding that the folks buy a lot of other stuff when they come pick up. Right. So that's that's part of that omni channel. And I think, yeah. you know, Target's really digging into that. Right. I think Target, they're on the forefront of trying to get people to kind of, you know, come on in. You can buy your stuff online. But when you get in here, we want you to spend more in the store. And they, I think they're finding it working for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll give a tip to the retailers out there. If, uh, if uh, you're trying to get people in the store, I saw a sign the other day that I think will work well has a sign in the window that says, ladies clothes, half off. And I started to go in that store. And, and I'm just kidding. And it's a joke, everyone. No, no mean text. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining us. Good information, sir. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Michael. All right. And thank you for joining us around the country. Hey, let us know what you think. Are, are you in retail? Do you own retail properties? What are you seeing in your market? Uh, please share it uh, with us. And thank you for sharing the show. And thank you for listening. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh. And join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Buxton. Take leasing site selection and due diligence to the next level. Make the right decisions with on-demand mobile data. Visit buxtonco.com. By Bull Realty. For proven commercial real estate asset and occupancy solutions, contact me. My email is michael at bullrealty.com. By Commercial Agent Success. Expert level commercial real estate broker training. 
Cloud Access One, up to 21 one-hour videos. Visit CommercialAgentSuccess.com. Thank you for reviewing, subscribing, and sharing America's Commercial Real Estate Show.